so I'm Nick Monfort, and uh, I want to start and tell you a little about the Trope Tank here at MIT, which uh, is a lab I direct. Um, uh, it looks like this. It's uh, 250 meters away. And uh, we have a lot of uh, what some people would call old computers. I call uh, material computing systems from uh, recent decades um, to uh, provide access to students and researchers and people doing creative work um, to uh, things that emulators and uh, documentation, other sorts of uh, uh, ways that people might get at computing, you know, don't always um, uh, don't always communicate, uh, don't always reveal to people. Um, uh, we ha uh, have uh, systems like this, uh, like the Commodore 64 here, um, but uh, we also do work on contemporary uh, computational uh, questions, doing research and creative work. We have a, a story generation system that is a collaboration with three others that was presented yesterday in uh, Sydney, Australia, and uh, I'm headed next week to ePoetry in London to present a system that automatically creates erasure poetry from arbitrary web pages. Uh, that I did with two collaborators. So that's some of the stuff. And one of the things that takes place is that um, uh, the People's Republic of Interactive Fiction, of which uh, some representatives are here, and, and Val, a co-organizer of uh, App Party, uh, is, uh, is currently organizing, um, is there. I'm going to hand out uh, how to play interactive fiction. If uh, you would like to know more or have a reference card yourself about this, or if you know anyone who would, please feel free. Um, so that's, uh, that's some about the trope tank, and now there's the, uh, uh, there's the topic of uh, my presentation, which is one-liners. You know what one-liners are. The great thing about an escalator is it doesn't ever break. It just becomes stairs. I have a tattoo of myself over my entire body. Right? That's you know, some, some types of one-liners. Uh, uh, one-liner uh, joke, uh, staple in comedy is an example, but there's also uh, Picasso's one-liners where he did uh, drawings that involved just using a single line. Right? So the variety of one-liners that we're going to talk about today is not entirely disconnected from these in terms of their simplicity and, and brevity, but, um, but they look more like this. Um, and this is... Uh, um, one from the uh, International Obfuscated C Code Contest. Uh, this is a program by Fuketa uh, Pono that was the winner of the one-liner. They have a category in the uh, IOCCC that uh, is specifically for one-liners. And so here uh, you can see this program and um, it's going to be cumbersome for me to run things. So fortunately I have uh, some of the output on a slide. Uh, what this program does is it produces um, various types of um, elementary cellular automata. You can input uh, 256 different numbers um, and it uses those as the rules for building the cellular automata and for executing it. So it's an interactive program that allows, you know, reasonable, it's, it's maybe uh, not exactly clear how to use it, nor uh, due to, to its obfuscated nature is it exactly clear how it's written. But, um, but it captures a lot of aspects that are interesting about one-liners, which shows how much computation can be done in a short amount of code, and also rewards study and the examination of these programs. Now, uh, there's uh, fun one-liners like this one, and um, uh, that's a lot of what I'll be talking about. I'll be talking about one-liners that are created for um, poetic and artistic purposes, for entertainment, for amusement. But there's also utility one-liners, the idea that, you know, this is a recent ebook, Perl one-liners explained. And there's plenty of uh, cases in Perl and Awk and in other computer languages where um, you may actually want to learn how it is that uh, one-liners are, um, uh, are, are encoding certain uh, capabilities that are built into the language. And it would be useful to uh, figure out how to write one-line programs uh, at the command prompt uh, in the shell in order to be able to do uh, work that uh, is converting line endings or numbering lines of a program or things like this. Um, so here's uh, one of the... Uh, uh, entries from the jargon file. Um, this uh, describes uh, the context of one-liner wars, and here there's acknowledgement that one-liners both are an amusement, they can be interesting, but they could also be useful, right? But clearly it's uh, seen as, um, uh, as, a, um, as a way to uh, 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 compete with others, uh, just like the uh, um, IOCCC, as a way to engage with computation, um, not perhaps alien from the context of the demo scene that we're all familiar with. 
And this program, which you see it, is uh, that's an APL program, which, as it says, is um, this program computes uh, all the prime numbers from one up into uh, up to whatever number is entered as a parameter. Um, how it does this, I don't know, but I do have a book on APL programming techniques. If someone wants to look into it, it's sitting right over there by the Commodore 64. You're welcome to check it out. Uh, there's also an implementation of John Conway's Game of Life, speaking of cellular automata, that is only nine symbols long in APL. Part of this comes from the fact that APL is an applicative language, very powerful. Ken Iverson developed it in 1955 for IBM. But also, uh, another aspect is that APL has an expanded character set. And so one of the things I have in the truck bank is a print terminal from the mid-1970s that um, actually has all the APL symbols, like the IOTA, which no longer is on the screen, but was a moment ago. OK, so this is a, um, a boring-looking uh, software engineering uh, type of entry from page 276 of Philip A. LeBlanc's Keys to Successful Software Development from 1999. And uh, it is actually saying some interesting things about the concept of a line of code. Because one would say that if you uh, are going to write some one-liners, you better know what a line of code is. Because otherwise, you won't know whether you wrote a one-liner or not. Um, and one of the things here is that uh, lines of code, or LOC, you know, is one of the major standards for um, figuring out things about software productivity, um, how much programmers are working, how much their output is. And it's a much derided standard. but People haven't, uh, by and large, come up with much better ones, certainly ones that are general across different languages. And so here, um, this, uh, this is provided that there are lines. They exist across languages. And uh, there's a physical and logical distinction that's made in this uh, discussion here, where you could have a, a, a physical line of code. might be what fits on a terminal window, what, pr what fits on a print terminal uh, printout, what fits on a, a console uh, across the screen, um, a logical line uh, could possibly go on, and that's certainly the case with the uh, Commodore 64 and other uh, systems that allow you to have uh, longer logical lines and uh, to have them labeled with a single line number. So what's labeled with one line number is a logical line in many cases um, for those languages that have line numbers, but there's also the question then of what physically will fit on the screen. Um, so uh, this is, of course, uh, a rather uh, dry look at uh, lines of code. We would suggest that the authors of uh, Extraordinary one-liners would not wish to accept lines of code as a measure of their productivity, probably, um, because they would just be doing one thing all the time. Um, in thinking about physical and logical lines, so we might ask, um, how long is uh, a line of code? How long are these lines? And, uh, and why are they this particular length? And the most uh, standard length uh, that we can imagine would be 80 characters. That's the size of a, of a terminal window nowadays. Uh, if we want to send something through the mail, uh, send an email, we might want to limit that to 72 so that people can quote things. But, uh, but basically, we'd say that uh, the 80 column is, uh, uh, is pretty much a standard. Why is that? Well, it's uh, because of this device right here. I have uh, it's not a device in that you can't plug your headphones into it, but it is a means of uh, storing computation and a very popular means. And I'm going to hand some of these out. Some, some of those are punched uh, in a diagonal pattern, probably indicating that uh, someone is producing erroneous output in a loop. And some of those are not punched. Um, but uh, this is, uh, these are all instances of what was developed in 1928 uh, by international business machines and came to be called the IBM card. And uh, decades later, in 1967, uh, ANSI standard uh, X3.21 for that year um, made this uh, a true national standard. Uh, this, was the, uh, this was the punch card that would be used. Punch cards, uh, as you might guess from the development of this one in 1928, predate computing. They're used for all sorts of purposes for the census as early as uh, uh, 1900. Um, but uh, um, they were one of the technologies, along with uh, teleprinters and teletypes, that were brought in and connected to computers for input ac and, and access to those and, um, uh, and for output as well. So this card was there in 1928 as the columns. Um, now, this is uh, actually an earlier uh, machine, a 1919 photo of 
a sorting machine. And I bring it up to show that there's a lot of equipment that was involved with tabulation and with uh, the use of punch cards um, early in uh, initially US history, but also then throughout Europe. Um, and it's uh, actually devices uh, like this and the investment that people had in uh, already having machinery like this around that uh, really disinclined um, IBM, um, a company that earlier had been known uh, before some mergers as the tabulating machine company by Herman Hollerith, um, disinclined IBM from uh, changing the size of the card uh, when, they, uh, uh, when they developed this um, 1928 card, uh, which was capable of carrying more information. So the earlier cards, uh, standardized around 1910, um, had 45 columns of round holes. And they were designed um, for the 1890 census by Herman Hollerin. Um, and uh, so IBM wanted to keep the same size, because even though a lot of things would have to change in terms of doing tabulation and working with the holes that are punched in the card, um, there were also things that they wanted to keep fixed. And they wanted to keep older equipment. Uh, that could be retrofitted, and they wanted to keep manufacturing similar types of things. So it's a case where there's this type of inertia um, from, the, uh, from the form of um, an earlier means of communication. Now, why is it, though, you might ask, that back in 1890, back in preparation for the 1890 census, did, did Herman Holler actually develop this size of a card? And the reason is this right here. Cards are made 3.25 by 7. 375 inches, very close, although not exactly the same, to the size of the 1887 U.S. large paper currency. Um, so U.S. bills were reduced in size in 1929 by 20% to their current dimensions. So this is a, this is a story of, of influence that plays out uh, again and again in many contexts. And one of the things that people have around them look that's standard um, is something like currency and coins. Now, Hollerith really was interested specifically in um, using the boxes that the Treasury uh, had around um, that they used for sorting bills to be able to deal with this card. So again, it goes back to the sorting machine, uh, but to earlier instances of developing something of a, of a particular size. And one of my favorite stories about the influence of uh, currency, coin, you know, the, the way that money is sized on media technologies um, it was in 1985, Jupe Sinju at Phillips um, was uh, was working. They wanted to make the the um, this it wasn't in uh, um, 1985. It was a, years, a few years earlier. Wanted to make the compact disc um, have a hole which was a different size than um, the LP record because they didn't want people to stick it on their turntable by mistake. Okay, and they said so it needed to be some other size. Well, what size would it be? Well, it could be smaller or larger. It was, it seemed easier to make it larger, but having a discussion about what, you know, what size to make it. And he took a, uh, a dime from the Netherlands out of his pocket and said, it, sh it should be this big. And everyone said, oh yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> so uh, the dime from the Netherlands actually exactly fits into the hole in the CD for this reason. <laughs> Um, so, uh, this picture here should prove that the large currency of the late 1880s was the same size as the punch card. Of course, if you believe that, then you would think that the moon and Apple's hockey puck mouse are the same size too, based on this picture. So, don't take my slide's word for it, but there's uh, plenty of on the influence of U.S. currency on punch cards in Douglas Jones, punch cards, a brief illustrated technical history, Frank Da Cruz, Columbia University computing history, Biles Bolton and DeRees Herman Hollerith, inventor, manager, entrepreneur, and other articles like this. All right, so with that introduction, figuring out you know, where the line came from, why we have something that's an 80 column line, I want to talk uh, briefly about three families of one-liners. I was planning to uh, run some code, but uh, the way I'm presenting this and the time I have left uh, will not make that quite feasible. So I'll sketch a little bit how there are some different trajectories in making one-line programs. Um, so these are, uh, these are three examples that I'm going to look into. Um, it's a long uh, line in the middle, a 256 character program, but this is one of the uh, practices in Perl that I've been, uh, that I've been working on. Um, the first of these is a program that uh, is, uh, this one happens to be by 216, but it's based on work by uh, Villa Mateus 
um, hyped for that. Uh, I'm a biz net, uh, finished demo scene, and um, I'll, uh, I'll show a little bit about what this type of work is and how it uses C. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, the, the idea is just to, to pipe the output of this, which is going to be in the form of characters, to a 8 kilohertz, 8-bit um, audio device. And, uh, and then dot, dot, dot. <laughs> this is the third of the videos that uh, were done about these. try to begin to explain what uh, is going on with these short C programs. So. <laughs> So actually, that's the cone of the speakers popping in. Yeah. Right. 
and then remaining at that same position than when I grew up with programming. Um, <laughs> so, so all of this, you know, just from, uh, in, in this case, uh, a quite a complex program, it's just about value one twenty eight. There's some good opportunities to um, play around with this stuff on, uh, you can even do it on the web, you can do it if there's a JavaScript uh, interface for it. And I'm also just going to play one of the super black pieces very briefly to give you a sense of what that is. And uh, he um, experimented by typing things on his typewriter to see you know, how much text was good. It doesn't say on here, but he also actually looked at postcards, another curious early media technology that depended a great deal on the postal system and the way, way that the mail system worked, and figured out that 160 characters seemed like it would be good enough. Right? <laughs> type now, of course, the fact that a typewriter, how, how wide, you know, what's the most you can type across the page of a typewriter? Um, it's not standardized, standardized much later than things like uh, punch cards, but uh, 80 columns is, uh, uh, is a good estimate for, for many, uh, many fonts. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting that 160 characters for SMS is exactly two times 80, the width of the 1928 IBM punch card. Okay, so um, here's, a, um, here's a program I will... Um, I think I will just tell you about rather than run. Although I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to show it to you uh, later on. But this is one in a series of seven programs that I wrote as a very simple poetry generators um, that are one-line Perl programs, 256 character Perl programs. And when I say a poetry generator, um, I don't mean that it uh, is considered uh, creative or imaginative um, or that it expresses uh, deep felt emotion. Um, but rather that it's an exploration of language that when you run the program and look at the output, um, many people would recognize as being a poem rather than a bunch of garbage or uh, a uh, letter to your congressman or uh, something else. Okay? And so this is actually one of, um, uh, one of the series of PPG 256. And um, yeah, when I revised it, I, I found uh, the, the reason it has a comment at the end is uh, as I, f I fix these things later on due to um, sensitivity to uh, a particular uh, version of Perl that I was using that I, I wanted it to run in the current version. And I, I found that I had uh, um, become more skillful at writing these so I had space left over even though I really wanted them to be exactly 256 characters. But, um, uh, but these are, these are some programs I've done, and uh, I've also done a series of concrete poems called uh, Concrete Pearl, uh, which are 32 characters each. Um, and then a program that um, I will hand out bookmarks of. And, and uh, won't say uh, way too much more about is. Um, uh, this uh, 10 print chart string to a 5.5 plus rand 1 go to 10, which I wrote a book about with nine others, including Shifty, who's right here, Noah Bonner. 
And um, it's a, uh, to me, it's a great example of how, um, it, it's not totally perplexing, it's not highly obfuscated, but for someone coming to programming for the first time and looking at this, it's not obvious why it does what it does. It's through the process of typing it in, looking at the output, making changes, which one is encouraged to do in almost every version of this program that we found on the web and in print, um, that you learn more about how the computer works and how it operates. And um, so I, I will um, show this and talk about it a bit on the C64, um, but, bef but to prepare you for that, I also want to share two Commodore 64 one-liners. And I'll just mention that one of them is based on this uh, series of paintings by Francois Morlet that is in the permanent collection of the Centre Pompidou in, in Paris. Um, he did this based on the parody of the digits of pi, so you can see on the left side um, the reason that the first two tiles are white is because three and one are odd, and then four is black, uh, indicates black because it's even. Um, one is uh, odd, so it's white again, and so he chose how to paint his paintings this way. And then Damien Hirst's um, Spot paintings are the other thing I wanted to mention. Um, and uh, I'll show you some Commodore 64 one-liners that pertain to these two. Can we switch to the Commodore 64? Coming up now, and I think it will go straight to the Commodore 64. You probably want to shut that projector off if possible, because okay. you'll get a blue box on the screen. <laughs>
put kind of stuff together and he showed me a musician uh, named uh, Herbatsky or Keith Wolf and he showed me a work by him and said, hey, you really got to see this program. Uh, he just wrote one line of Commodore 64 code and uh, makes just a whole bunch of random music with the sound chip. And I said, no way, really? Did you see who, uh, who wrote that program? And he said, oh, yeah, it was you, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, why did I do this? Because um, if you know the Commodore 64 SID chip, it's, uh, well, it used to be very confusing to me. I don't know, now 20 years later or whatever, I think I understand at least the basics of it. I think we don't have audio. Oh, wait, there's no audio? But I can, um, okay. Is the TV on at least? You can crank that up, maybe? Uh, yeah, it's not working with the TV. All right, well, but it will be in just a second. So are you ready to run it? <laughs> sure. Okay. One second. Yeah, so all this does is just uh, take a random uh, register of the sync and write a random number to it. You might have to increase the volume. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, yes. <laughs> Trying to plug your audio into me? No. Okay. All right. Then we're fine. Try, try it out sometime in fun. 
device. If you don't know Commodore 64 emulators, that's uh, perhaps that's the Zeta music. Right? Yes. Yeah. It works on Linux and uh, Windows and Mac as well. So enjoy your one line uh, programs. Cool. Yeah. All right, thanks.